morning, everyone. And welcome to St. Mary's. If you're joining us online, a special welcome to you. May you be blessed by spending this time with us together. Well, here in England, it is actually... Is it still raining outside? Yes. Yes. But we do give thanks to God for the amazing seasons. We would like a bit more spring and summer at this time of the year, but we do give thanks. For those joining us, my name is Tim as part of the leadership. It's my great privilege to welcome you here. We're reminded that at the beginning of the service that actually living life following Christ is about 24-7 living. It's not just about Sunday mornings and, I don't know, Wednesday or Thursday nights. It's about our whole life. So the notices are one of the hardest things to get right in a church. So we start with them. Then you forget them all, hopefully, only until the end of the service when you instantly remember them all again and you can respond to them. How does that sound? Not bad, not bad. There you are. Well, at least I've got one response for those on the uh, street. Well, let's just, you know, go through. The key thing at the moment is that there are two key leaflets to take home. One is a reminder of all the Easter services, and the second is opportunities to serve and to help St. Mary's in the year ahead. We do commend both of these leaflets to you. But just focusing briefly on the Easter services. Firstly, Monday, Thursday is a, going to be a communion and tenebrae service, and it's been uh, jiggled with the round. I've had great fun with it, actually changing its format this year. But if you're planning to come on Monday, Thursday, I currently I'm in need of five readers to help do the different readings. If you're going to be here, please see me after the service. If you're able to help with Monday, Thursday, please do. On Good Friday, we're going to be in our morning service, which is for all the church family. We're going to be having different stations around the cross and around the church that we're going to move between, reminding us of all those events. We lasted the stations back in 2016 when Mark Newman was with us. And so we do remember fondly um, uh, Mark's time here. But we do encourage you to come to that as we move around the different stations designed for all ages and to engage. And there'll be a small takeaway from each station to remind us of those events. So please do come to that. But then in the afternoon on Good Friday, we have some wonderful reflections being brought to us. And so we're looking forward to that service too. So please do come. There's a lot happening. Likewise, if you're a younger family and you're joining us online, there's a great Easter extravaganza on Holy Saturday. Please do book for that to help us know the numbers for that. We do plan for that, and that will be really good. So friends, there's different things going on. We do commend all those things to you. Thank you to the amazing team that were here yesterday cleaning the litter in the churchyard in the neighboring streets. How many bags did you collect, uh, Roger? Do you recall, Anthony? How many bags? Ten. Ten? Significant amount of rubbish and litter. Guys, thank you for that amazing service to the church and to our community and the witness, because we know how uh, you know, litter gathers. So thank you to those. Look out for the next one that will happen at some point. All resources provided. We do, again, encourage you to do that. But today, if you're up for exploring some of the wildlife at this time of the year, and there is wildlife in this parish, do meet outside the church tower at three o'clock today. I would suggest that you may wear walking shoes or your gum boots. What do I mean by gum boots? Wellingtons, yes. I'm sorry, even though I've lived more of my life in this country, I still use Kiwi language at times. But do wear your Wellingtons, and we do commend that to you, three o'clock today, to explore some of the different wildlife at this time. We do, present around us, we do commend that to you. On a Saturday note, coming up this week, we say farewell on Thursday at 1.45 at Bedford Crematorium to a dearly loved church member, and that is Malcolm Howarth. Those of you will know that his wife also passed away a few weeks earlier, and we had her funeral service recently. Malcolm's funeral is going to be, as I've said, at Bedford Crematorium on Thursday at 1.45. Afterwards, you're all invited to come back for refreshments and to share memories. After that, we do again encourage you and commend you to do that. But then on a slightly different note, on a happier note, coming up on next Sunday, 
24th of March, we have a baptism service here at 1245, but of one of our church families, and that is Scott and Shannon's two children, and we're so looking forward to that. So if you're able to stay on next Sunday, and don't worry, you're all invited for refreshments over to the Jubilee Hall afterwards. The family have extended a general invitation. So if you are free to support them next Sunday, please do come. It promises to be a special service as we give thanks for the gift of two amazing children. Isn't that right, guys? Yes, great, excellent, great. So that's next Sunday after this service. There'll be a, a baptism service at 12.45. Please do stay, and you get fed afterwards too. We come to that time in the year when we revise our electoral roll. Now, what is the electoral roll? I'm not talking about the governmental electoral roll, which you uh, have to be on if you want to vote in the general election. But the church has its own electoral roll, which is part of the sign of membership in the Church of England. And if you regard this church as your home church, as your church that you like to engage in, and your name isn't on the current electoral roll over there, please do pick up one of the forms and fill it in. If you're not sure, please talk to one of the people around you, because I'm sure people could fill you in about that. But again, we do commend that to you. That will be open another couple of weeks, but please do. As I've said, it's a reminder of what it means to you know, be a member. And the piece of paper that you fill in looks a little bit like this, a little bit like this. So it's all available on the side by the sofa corner. We again encourage you to that. But finally, on a different note, it is my great privilege today to publish the bands of marriage between Damon, Steve and Minnie and Natasha Louise Martin, both of the parish of St. Mary's Ainsbury and who wish to be married in this church by virtue of their connection with this parish. This is for the third time of our scheme, the third time of our scheme. If any of you know any reason in law why these persons may not marry each other, you are to declare it now. So that's Damon and Natasha. Any objections? Are you sure? That's always a good sign. I'm glad. Let's pray for them. Loving God, we do thank you for the different seasons of life. We thank you for the news of the baptism service next week. We thank you for the chance to remember those no longer with us, especially Malcolm Howard's service coming up. Today we also remember the special couple, Damon and Natasha, as they begin an exciting new chapter in their lives. Loving God in all seasons of life, in all celebrations and thanksgivings and memorial services, Lord, may we know your amazing love, that love that sustains our lives this day and always. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, today, friends, we're thinking about what it means to live as God's chosen people, how we're called to live, rejecting earthly things and keeping our eyes firmly fixed on God above. And so we're going to begin by singing our opening two songs, Jesus, let your kingdom come and take my life, especially whose words challenge us to live for God. If able, friends, would you please stand? Jesus said 
Yes, Lord, we thank you that you call us to live our lives as you would have us live. Thank you that you take our lives broken they, though they are. Even though we get things wrong, thank you for your immense grace, that grace that forgives and encourages. Lord, this day may we know your grace and mercy in all our lives as we seek to know you more. And Lord, as some of our younger ones now leave us, Lord, we thank you for their lives. We thank you for all that they contribute and are part of this family. Lord, go with them, strengthen them, that they would learn more about your amazing love and celebrate you as the God who loves each one of us, the God who calls us his children. In your name we pray. Amen. And so as our young ones do leave us, we continue singing two further songs. Father, you have searched me and the Lord's my shepherd. A reminder especially in Father, you have searched me that even in the darkest dark, it is not too dark for God. Thank you, musicians.
We thank you that your comfort is a heavenly comfort, a comfort that comforts all else when human comfort fails. Lord, this day may all of us be aware of your amazing love, your amazing comfort all the days of this life, a comfort that carries us into eternity. In your name we pray. Amen. So as we continue with our intercessions as Ellie leads us, would you please be seated, everyone? <clears throat> let us pray for the church and for the world, and let us thank God for his goodness. Lord, we come to you today in pride and confidence as your chosen people, yet in humility as those who constantly fall short of what and who you have called us to be. As we continue during this season of Lent to remember your example of sacrifice and love which goes on giving, May we lay our pride and earthly ambitions at the foot of your cross and receive again from you and you alone the mandate to serve you, your people and your world, clothed only in your righteousness and grace. May we be those whom you have called blessed, the meek and poor in spirit, those who mourn for our lost world, those who are hungry to do your will. May we be merciful, pure in heart, and always ready and willing to be your peacemakers. Give us courage to share in your sufferings, to care for your people, and to live out your message of forgiveness and reconciliation to all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our world, and we are so aware, as always, of much darkness, injustice, and sorrow. And we ask again for your light, love, and joy to prevail in every country and in every human heart. We pray for leaders everywhere, whether they are voted in justly or rule through tyranny, that you may touch them, change them, win them with love, and use them to transform their communities and lead their people to peace, justice, and unity. We pray for the church in all its shapes and sizes, especially remembering those who serve in war-torn areas, those who worship in danger of persecution. We pray for more unity between denominations and within our own Church of England that we might increasingly turn our eyes upon Jesus, whose name we bear, and rejoice in our diversity and share gladly with one another to serve our needy world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, Lord, we pray for ourselves, our families, 
our neighbours and colleagues, for all known to us personally who need our prayers, especially at this time. We pray for those waiting for medical results or treatment and those in recovery, including our Bishop Allen as he recovers from surgery and those in this congregation who struggle with ill health, sadness or fear. Thank you, Father, for this season of spring, the reminder of new life and of your tender care for every creature that you have made. Fill us afresh today with your Holy Spirit to carry your joy into every moment and every situation of this coming week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Will you join with me in the special prayer for today? Gracious Father, you gave up your Son out of love for the world. Lead us to ponder the mysteries of his passion, that we may know eternal peace through the shedding of our Saviour's blood, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for leading us in our intercessions this morning, Ali. Anne will now come and bring us our Bible reading for today. Thank you, Anne. The reading can be found on page 1184 in Colossians chapter 3. Paul is writing to the Jewish and Gentile believers to encourage them to live as those made alive in Christ. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, Barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, 
as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you have a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in, in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Anne, for bringing us our reading this morning. Let's pray, everyone. Loving God, thank you that you welcome us as your children. Thank you that by your grace, we are your chosen people. Help us now, Lord, to be encouraged by these words to know your blessing, to know your immense love and how you call us to live. In your name we pray. Amen. As I look around us this morning and look around at each person, God has given us all different years of life to live life in this world. Think of the years you've enjoyed so far. What are you looking forward to in the years ahead? What are going to be some of the challenges in the years ahead? Because living life requires us to adapt to the ever-changing circumstances around us and the season of life that we find ourselves in. Think for a minute of the different seasons in your life so far. No doubt you can think of other seasons where life looked very different. Perhaps you may have had dependence. Perhaps you were out in the workforce. Perhaps you were, you know, caring for elderly relatives. Whatever the case, is that actually living life requires us to regularly review our lives and to think about those things that are good for us and to recognize those things that aren't good for us. How good are you at recognizing what is good for your life, especially what is good in the eyes of God? I'm not talking about whether you have that extra chocolate bar. I'm not talking about that kind of good. I'm talking about God's goodness. In the verses that precede today's reading from Colossians, the Apostle Paul has been reminding the church in Colossae of the things that harmed their lives before they came to faith. Because the ways of the world tend to harm our lives in so many ways. But now that they know who Christ is and what Christ has done for them, the Apostle Paul is teaching them in today's passage how they should live as God's chosen people. And friends, this morning I want all of us to know that all of you are God's chosen people, without exception. I cannot choose who God loves. God loves each one of us because he loves us because he loves us. All of us are equally precious to him. If you feel there are things that separate you from God, I, can I say, make use of the prayer corner after the church, but there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Amen? There is absolutely nothing. So today, it's a case of, you know, being reminded, as we see in the Apostle Paul's teaching, of, the, of how we should live as God's chosen people. And if you've got your Bibles handy, page 1184, we begin in verses 1 and 2. Paul writing to the church in Colossae saying, Since then you have been raised with Christ, 
Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your, things on thing, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Set your hearts and minds on things above. Friends, is what we're called to. And this needs to be our focus if we want to live as God's chosen people. And friends, living as God's chosen people means that we're also God's heirs. We are sons and daughters of the living God. There is no greater honor. In a sense, this is a greater honor than being knighted or receiving, you know, an honor from the king, uh, as in the earthly king. This is an honor that actually far above all that. And so here, as I've said, we're reminded of the need to set our hearts and minds on things above instead of setting our lives on earthly things. Now, how many of you have enjoyed living life to date? Yes? Life, as we know, is a rich tapestry of good seasons, of challenging seasons. But life is precious. Life is special. And the world has a way at times of wanting us to live according to its values. What now follows in this passage are actually two lists of earthly things that we're going to go through. Two lists that can distract us from following God. Two lists where every item is equal to the other. No one item is higher than the others. Sometimes in life we like to rank different sins or whatever. That is not the case before God. Sin is sin. And Paul is talking about two lists of earthly things that especially the Colossians need to learn to avoid because this is the way they have lived. But now he's reminding them of how to live. And after we run through these lists quickly, we will then focus on actually the way we're called to live our lives, focusing on things above. So here we have two lists, starting in verse five. One list that focuses on sexual sin, one that focuses on sins of anger. And again, friends, they are both equal. First, we have verses 5 to 7, where we read Paul saying, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. So friends, in this way of living, we are reminded that it is a person's earthly nature that dominates and rules one's life. A nature that at the heart of it is filled with selfishness. How many of you have ever been selfish at some point in your life? I want, I want. How many of you know Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? Yes, how many of you recall that story? I remember growing up on, yes. And there are different characters of children within that who all uh, end up getting a golden ticket to enter into uh, the chocolate factory. Sorry? All right, these two, right. So, right, we just need to have a little bit quiet. That's great. So, the fact is selfishness is not good. Selfishness is not good. And at the heart of our earthly desire is a desire for selfishness for selfish, physical, sensual desires, a nature that needs to be, as Paul says, put to death. Now, just to clarify, having desires in themselves are not wrong, but there is a difference in life between right and wrong desires. Wrong desires are those that come at the expense of others and lead to division between people and the destruction of people's lives. So wrong desires are those that actually run down other people, and we need to watch that. But did you notice that this list also ended with greed? How many of you know the meaning of the word greed? How many of you would like greed associated with you as a person? On this particular characteristic, the Bible commentator Garland writes, Greed refers to the haughty and ruthless belief that everything, including other persons, exists for one's own personal amusement and purposes. 
Essentially, it turns our own desires into idols. It is the overweening desire to possess more and more things and to run roughshod over other peoples to get them. It stands opposed to the willingness to give to others regardless of the cost to self. Greed always lusts for more. And I think greed is so much part of the human condition to want more and more outside of God. The fact is, as Jesus taught us in Matthew 6, in the Sermon of the Mount, he says, we cannot serve both God and mammon, meaning money. If, If our desires sit on the throne of our hearts rather than God, then our desires are idolatrous. So friends, in other words, if we choose to place our desires at the center of our lives rather than God, our desires are idolatrous and contravene two of the Ten Commandments. The second commandment, you shall not make idols. Now physically, we may not make stone or wood idols and set them up in our houses, but anything that takes the place of God that actually becomes more important is an idol in our life. So that's the first commandment we contravene. The second one is where God says, you shall have no other gods before me, which is the first commandment of the Ten Commandments. So friends, those are the things that we need to, in a sense, watch. We need to make sure that our lives are not filled with these characteristics. But the second list of earthly things, because Paul hasn't finished He's very good at highlighting those things that affect our lives because he wants us to understand what it means to live as God's chosen people. He now focuses on the sins of anger. Now, how many of you have ever got cross in your life with somebody? Yes. We all will express ourselves in different ways. Some will be more verbose. Others will find other ways of expressing that. But as Paul says in verse 8, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Friends, these are the sins of anger that are inherent and common to all of humanity. If you're sitting there and thinking this is something you struggle with, be rest assured you are not alone. It is something inherent in the human condition. But God provides an answer for that. That will come on to shortly. But about this list of the sins of anger, Garland in his Bible commentary continues to write, anger in this context refers to a chronic feeling as opposed to the occasional outburst of rage. More subtle expressions of anger ooze out in the malice we bear others and the pot shots we take to defame their reputations. Filthy language from your lips does not simply refer to curse words. It has in mind the abuse of language we use to hurt others. Christian speech is not determined solely by whether it is true or false, but whether it helps or harms another. But whether it helps or harms another. Friends, this is what Paul is talking to the church in Colossae about the sins of anger and about how some people, how we all respond at times. Because hopefully we all know the damage misplaced words can cause in our lives. How many of you remember back to your school days? Can you think back that far? Yes? Yes? Or, or is it all a, a blurry memory? But you'll remember one of the chants that you would sometimes hear in the school playground. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, or words that affect. Friends, that is one of the lies of the enemy. Because yes, sticks and stones can break our bones, but how many of you have ever been hurt by words that have been said to you? How many of you have ever allowed those words to shape your life even today? Because, friends, when people say unkind things to us, we have a habit of remembering them. Yes, we remember them. And if we don't deal with them before the cross of Christ, they may not hurt that other person, but they certainly hurt us. And they shape us. And at times, one of the great 
joys, but also the great sadnesses. The great joy is seeing people released from those. The sadness is people who walk with those herds decade after decade after decade, thinking it defines who they are. Friends, the only person you can define who you are is Jesus. And if Jesus thinks you're great, if he thinks you're, you know, in a sense, wonderful, if he thinks that actually, well, he has chosen to choose you, if he has chosen to call you his son or daughter, then regardless of what the world says, actually, it, what the world says is not true. Because what God says reigns, not just in this life, but for all eternity. Isn't that good? So, friends, if there is something that has been said to you in past years that you still live with, make use of the prayer corner afterwards to ask God to help you to choose, A, to forgive them, but also, B, to believe that those words are not true. Because otherwise, things shape our lives and they destroy our lives and prevent us from being the people that God has called us to be. And people, all of our lives will have different things in them that we need to continually bring God and say, Lord... I choose to forgive. Help me to live as your people, the people that you've called us to be. So damaging words, misplaced words, can cause havoc in our lives. And so, you know, we've got to make sure that we don't allow them to, that we live as Christ has called us. And as Paul, you'll think that Paul perhaps has had enough or that he's said enough. He's actually got more to say because he goes on in verse 9 to say, do not lie to each other. Friends, if we are to truly set our minds on things above and live as Christ calls us, then we need to recognize that lying is at odds with Christian love because lying is about deceiving others and seeking to gain an advantage over them. As Paul emphasizes this again in one of his other letters, this time to the church in Ephesus, he says these words found in Ephesians 4. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. So friends, if we choose to lay aside this way of worldly living, this way of earthly living, with these two particular lists, of sins that we need to watch out for. The good news is that Paul then helps us to learn how we can live as his holy and dearly loved people. Because it's all very well to say, I reject this, but unless you've got something to fill your life with, actually, how do you live your life differently? Today at 12.45, we have another baptism service, actually of the grandson of a local uh, head teacher that I have the privilege of doing here. And as part of the service, we have those three statements about turning away from all that is wrong in the world, but then three statements about turning to Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Friends, that is so important to make sure we know what to do when we reject the earthly ways. Who do we turn to? How do we live, live our lives? So as I've said, Paul helps us. And as we continue in our reading, Paul then says these amazing things in verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Did you hear that? Holy and dearly loved. All of you are holy and dearly loved. Can you say to yourself this morning, I am holy and dearly loved. Let's say that together. I am holy and dearly loved. Let's say that again. I am holy and dearly loved. Let's say that one more time. I am holy and dearly loved. Friends, that is the truth of God's word. Do you believe it? Are you going to live it? Or are you going to allow the earthly things to overshadow? Because my prayer is that if you live those words that you've just said, then what you do next, as Paul says, is to clothe yourselves now, thankfully, friends, you've all come dressed today. That is a great joy. Once upon a time years ago, I think Julie knows where I'm about to go with this. We were back in Watford days. This is before I entered Anglican ordination. And we were in conversation with the then vicar, John Woodger, who passed into glory a couple of years ago. And one of his church wardens, we were out for dinner. And he was discussing about the forthcoming visit of the newly elected bishop of Hartford, Christopher Foster. I think it was Chris, yeah, Foster. Yes. And anyway, 
John was trying to persuade me to robe for that occasion. Because up until this time, friends, I just used to wear a suit and a tie because, of course, I wasn't ordained. And so, you know, he was trying to say to him, I'd love you to wear a Cambridge gown and your academic hood. And what does my wife say around the table after much discussion? Okay, Tim can wear his academic hood, but nothing else. <laughs> Isn't that right, darling? Can I say, it was one of those special moments that we've never forgotten. John and the church warden, his wife, have quoted since then. Sadly, most of those people are now in glory, but they're probably laughing if they can see. But the fact is, we're called to clothe ourselves. But with what? Well, as we read in this passage in verse 12, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. How many of you are good at clothing yourself with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, with patience? Friends, all of us are called to clothe ourselves with these very characteristics because these are God characteristics. These are the things that make us live life the way God has, uh, you know, intended. But all those things, if we had time, we would unpack each of those. Each of those are a sermon in itself. But what of those do you need to ask God for more in your life today? Because again, it's not a pick and mix order. It's actually a group that we're called to live in. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And can I say the one of that list of five that I suggest at times we ignore at our peril is kindness. I think kindness is one of the most, you know, actually under, under-emphasized attributes of how we're called to live our lives. I actually initially suggested to uh, my eldership that I should do my study leave on exploring the kindness of God. Then I discovered somebody had raced me to it with actually writing a book that's been recently released that I'm planning to get hold of. But kindness is something, as God intends, we need to learn. The message, a paraphrase description, not a translation, but a paraphrase that sometimes is a more dynamic rendering of the uh, of scripture translates this verse in a very powerful way this version paraphrase is saying so chosen by God for this new life of love dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you compassion kindness humility quiet strength discipline a new life of love I love that rendering a new life of love with a new wardrobe. How many of you at homes wish your earthly wardrobe could be updated at times, yes? Yes, no doubt you do. But the fact is, this is a special kind of wardrobe that won't cost you anything, and yet in one sense it will cost you everything because it's choosing to to live your life in a way that is different to the world. So, a new life of love with a new wardrobe that God himself has picked out for you. And if this wardrobe has been picked out by God, therefore it's got to be the best for you. Amen? Amen. And it doesn't stop there because we then learn how we can live wearing that new wardrobe as the community God calls us to be. We learn how we can live as the community God wants us to be. As Paul continues to say in verses 13 to 14, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Friends, when people hurt us, we need to say, I choose to forgive. That is something I have to practice every bit as much as each of you. When people hurt me, I have to say, I choose to forgive. Lord, help me to forgive. Because this is, after all, the Lord has forgiven us. There is nothing that is beyond being forgiven by God. And there is nothing 
that we cannot actually forgive somebody else for in, in this world. Yes, it may be a process of choosing to, but we are called to forgive. Because over all these virtues of learning to forgive, as the Lord forgave us, we're called to put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. As the message again paraphrases these two verses saying, be even-tempered. How many of you are even-tempered? I praise God that God has put around me people in this church who are incredibly even-tempered. So for when I get over, you know, enthusiastic or there's something I've done, they are there as the even-tempered. I praise God, and you know who you are who exercise that, and I'm very grateful to God for you. Be even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you. And as the message says of this final verse, and regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic all-purpose garment. Never be without it. So let me ask you this morning, are you wearing your basic all-purpose garment of love in your life? I want you to think of love, dare I say, if it's not too scandalous, as your underwear. Because it is your all-purpose garment over which you put everything else, never be without it. Is God's love a reflection of the love that we show in our lives to each other? Friends, this is how we're called to live as God's community. And this calling is for all Christians. There is no exceptions. No one is above these rules. They all apply to us. So is love been worn in your life? Is it your all-purpose garment? That is a question for us to ask ourselves today. Again, if you're not sure, make use of the prayer corner afterwards or turn to somebody you trust to actually allow them to pray with you. Because it's something we all need to work on. But yet again, Paul hasn't finished. He's still going. In verses 15 to 17, which finishes this section, Paul writes, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. The peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Letting the peace of Christ, which is not like the world's peace, but it's a shalom, holistic peace, rule in your hearts. Since of members of one body you are called to peace, we're called to live as peacemakers and be thankful let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another see teach and admonish each other with all wisdom through psalms hymns and songs from the spirit singing to God with gratitude in your hearts and whatever you do whether in word or deed do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him or as the message paraphrases it, you can see that I've been going backwards and forwards between the, the NIV translation and the paraphrase message. Let the peace of Christ keep you in tune with each other. Are you in tune with those people that are sitting around you? If not, what are you going to do about it? Are you in step with each other? None of this going off and doing your own thing. And cultivate thankfulness. Let the word of Christ, the message, have the run of the house. Give it plenty of room in your lives. Instruct and direct one another using good common sense. Friends, can I say at times, I wonder if common sense has gone out the window in the world. But God has given us that too. And sing, sing your hearts out to God. Let every detail in your lives, words, actions, whatever... Be done in the name of the Master Jesus, thanking God the Father every step of the way. So friends, there's a great challenge there. We have a pattern for how we're called to live as God's chosen people. And guess what? None of us are going to achieve that completely, entirely, this side of the veil. We're all works in progress. 
We're all works in progress. But the good news, God wants us to keep growing into his likeness. Are we prepared to allow him to keep working on our lives? So friends, what does this all have to teach us today? I hope that already you've picked up different pointers of what you've got to do in your life. But first, I believe we need to make sure that we learn to recognize and live out God's authority in our lives. The way he calls us to live here is his chosen people. Let us make sure we live like that, not as the world lives. As Garland also uh, says in his uh, commentary, you can see where I've got some of my thoughts from today. Today, our culture increasingly questions clear distinctions between right and wrong and good and evil that were taken for granted by earlier generations. Many assume that as independent human beings, we are each free to live by whatever standards we choose, and we resent any challenges to our lifestyle choices. But we also need to recognize that our moral sensitivity has been deadened by crudity and violence, which make up a regular intellectual diet for many in our culture. What we've got to realize is that actually we live under the Lordship of Christ, who makes it clear how we're called to live, a way that is different to the world. What will our response be today? That's the first thing, to recognize God's authority in our lives. But secondly, and a challenge for us, is to need to examine each of our lives to see if the world sees a difference in the way that we live our lives. Are we living according to these characteristics that we're called to as God's chosen people to clothe ourselves with? Because friends, if we live like the world, there's no distinctive characteristics between us and the world. Whereas if we live for Christ, if we live according to this, people will see a difference. And at the end of the day, Jesus is the answer for every life. Because he brings hope, he brings love, he brings strength and peace into all our lives. So friends, what will be our response today to this? Friends, on my heart, as I was preparing for this uh, a couple of weeks ago, These verses have been sitting with me and staying with me. Don't be surprised if these verses from 12 to 14 about what to clothe ourselves in live with us as a church through the year ahead. Perhaps I'm giving an indication of what may be coming at the annual meeting this year. But these are verses that we're called to live. Will we allow God to help us live lives like this, this day and every day? Because, friends, he wants us to live as his chosen people. Are we going to live like this? Well, as the musicians come back, in a few moments' time, we're going to be singing our final hymn of praise, which is a song of dedication. All to Jesus I surrender. All to you know, him I freely give. But before we get to singing this hymn of praise... It's appropriate to bring our lives before God in the words of this confession. The words of a confession that asks God to take our lives, to wash away all our iniquity, and to make us his chosen people. Let's now put up the words of the confession. Thank you, Gavin. Please do join in the responses. Wash away all my iniquity, And cleanse me from my sin, O God. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. So may Almighty God have mercy on us all. Forgive us our sins. Clothe us in his most amazing clothes that he offers to clothe us in. And bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord.
Friends, again I say, reiterate, if there's anything this morning that's touched your heart and mind that you would like a quiet moment of conversation and prayer, please turn to those around you or come to the prayer corner in front of the side chapel. But as we come now to our concluding hymn of praise, as I've said, a hymn of dedication, when we turn and say to Jesus, all to Jesus, I surrender, choosing to live on that which is from above, will that be our response today? Friends, this is also our offertory hymn. If able, would you please stand? May Christ crucified draw you to himself to find in him a sure ground for faith, a firm support for hope, and the assurance of sins forgiven. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always.
Amen. Let's now say the words of the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. What clothes are you clothed in today? Continue that discussion over refreshments. Thank you all for coming and God bless.